Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Today is Tuesday, prior to the vice presidential debate. So I thought I would clear my desk, basically. Remember that meeting the other day between Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine and Donald Trump? How awkward is that? Could it have been more difficult? Mainly because Trump favours Putin, and that became very, very obvious. But uh, I thought I'd do pictures for that. And those are interesting because they take Donald Donald Trump up to Election Day. So I'll give you those. Also, the U.S. Senate race in Michigan between Democrat Alyssa Slotkin and Republican Mike Rogers. I took a look at that. And Ryan Ruth, or Ralph as we British will pronounce it, he is the guy who was planning to assassinate Donald Trump, allegedly. He's pleading not guilty now, but the FBI released his handwriting. And so I thought I'd take a look at that, plus a whole bunch more. There is a new video up on the Enlightened Beings Club channel about whether we can choose the kind of transition we have after we die. This includes transition pictures for Stuart Wilde, who you may have heard of. He was palling around with Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer back in the day. And his crossover pictures and his transition are particularly fascinating and enlivening and enriching. And you might want to go and look at that. I put a link to that in the show notes below this video. And speaking of transitions, as I was, you probably noticed that Israel flew into Lebanon and took out the Secretary General of Hezbollah, a guy called Hassan Nasrallah. Israel occupied southern Lebanon for just over 18 years and then withdrew in 2000, and Nasrallah is credited partially anyway with helping that along. His idea is for one big Palestinian country that is home to Christians and Jews and Muslims who will just get along peacefully together, but it would mean dismantling Israel. And until that happens, people like him, he's not around anymore. In fact, the guy who replaced him was assassinated within hours. Israel's gradually working its way down the list, but as long as people like this exist, the pressure will continue to mount for some kind of peace deal. Iran right now is uh, re seeking vengeance on Israel for all of this, with hundreds of missiles being fired. But Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, is now gone. I went into his energy very briefly to see what his crossover would be like. And when I did, the picture was so quick, it was like a bug flying into a windshield or a pane of glass. Gone. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, bombed his bunker. The whole place collapsed in on itself and on him. And it was so quick, it not only blasted him out of his mortal self, but it appears from the pictures to have taken his consciousness with it. Because after the splat of the bug on the windshield, it was, you know, when you're driving through rain, heavy rain, and on the windshield there's water that ripples up in the wind, and it crawls up the windshield and then away. It was like that. His consciousness was like that. Such was the shock that he endured in that split second when the building collapsed. There was no time for a crossover, really. He just went. Anyway, I'd just like to mention a couple of U.S. Senate races that caught my eye this week. The first one is in Arizona between Carrie Lake, the MAGA Republican, and Democrat Ruben Diego. It does seem that the Republicans are abandoning Carrie Lake as a dead loss. Quite right, we've said this all the way along, because the polls show that Ruben Diego is too far ahead for her ever to catch up. And in the pictures, the last set I did for them, if you remember, she was a balloon. She was floating around him, just menacing him, just being irritating, but not moving forward, not being of any value as a candidate. And eventually she hit a wall. 
Ruben Giego carried on, went up to the next level and pressed forward and she was just left behind. Well, that's what seems to have happened. Carrie Lake is going nowhere. Also, the race in California between Adam Schiff, the Democrat, obviously, and Republican Steve Garvey, who's the baseball player. Way back, if you recall, before the primaries, Adam Schiff, did, or his campaign anyway, did something a little sly. They helped promote Steve Garvey in the hope of getting him elected as the Republican nominee because Adam Schiff knew he could beat Steve Garvey. And that's exactly what happened. Garvey became the nominee, and according to the pictures, he really was in it just for making friends, really, retaining his popularity, staying relevant. He wanted to be all things to all people. There was that trench, and he was jumping this side and that side, and eventually there was nothing to cling on to. He just slid down the wall. <coughs> and into oblivion. And then the next set of pictures I did showed Adam Schiff on a motorbike, which I drew incredibly sparingly because I can't draw vehicles. <laughs> but he shot along, leaving Steve Garvey behind. And Steve Garvey never stood a chance. That's exactly what has happened. Uh, Adam Schiff is so far ahead in the polls that Steve Garvey might as well just get out now. I was asked to take a look at the U.S. Senate race in Michigan, which I'm surprised I've not done, actually, between the Democrat Alyssa Slotkin, who I've never heard of, and the Republican Mike Rogers. Ditto. <laughs> who are these people? <laughs> Alyssa Slotkin is the U.S. representative for Michigan's 7th Congressional District. It used to be the 8th Congressional District, but then there was a bunch of shenanigans went on, and now she's in the 7th. But she is a former member of the CIA, whereas Mike Rogers is a representative for the 8th Congressional District, and he used to be in the FBI. So it's that kind of race. Very, very interesting. I put the two of them together to see what might happen. Uh, there they are, side by side. And immediately, Alyssa Slotkin flopped back into a beanbag. You're like, oh, oh, we're getting nowhere. I'm so tired. I don't know why. I think she's ahead in the polls. But, oh, I'm so tired and uh, it's pointless. It was quite dramatic in a way. And Mike Rogers looked at her and thought, all right, OK, well, I got to go. Good luck. And he walked off. Alyssa Slotkin waited until he was some distance away. And then she gets up with some kind of pretense here. She was like playing down her chances as if she was the underdog and it couldn't possibly go her way, this race. Oh no, woe is me, you know, that kind of thing. She gets out of the beanbag once he's gone, goes around the back of it and there's a raised up path, which I assume is where Mike Rogers is. He's walking along the path just aiming to win. But she is doing something slightly deceptive, maybe. She just clung onto it with her fingernails and inched along. He looked back, couldn't see her, or he missed her fingernails, and goes, oh, she's not coming. I guess I can ease off slightly. For some reason, he believed that he was going to win this. And he sloped along, hands in pockets, whistling completely happy, but not really having to try that hard. After all, where was his opponent? Nowhere. Alyssa Slotkin was still doing her thing, down below, inching along bit by bit by her fingernails. Mike Rogers came to a little hill and got a surprise. There was some adjustment he had to make. This could be the election itself. But he had to make an adjustment. Something happened that extended his journey and demanded more stamina of him. So he had to go around the hill, something he wasn't expecting, and then he could go down to a win. Meanwhile, Alyssa Slotkin had reached the hill as well, but she'd engaged in some kind of shortcut. She put in the work, laboured away and was in a position to climb up onto the path ahead of Mike Rogers. 
he was still coming around the hill, sloping around, laid back. Alyssa Slotkin, thanks to her advantage, and really putting in the work, could win. I think she's ahead in the polls. She could win. Mike Rogers could win, too. He could prevail if he didn't fall for that complacent thing again that so many candidates seem to face of, oh, well, this is going to be fine, or she's nowhere to be seen. I can win this. For whatever reason, I don't know what the circumstances are. But he just eased his way languorously round the hill. And if he does that, he could find that Slotkin wins simply because he didn't pick up the pace when he needed to. Now, Ryan Ruth, or Routh, as we British would pronounce that, he is the guy who was planning for a very long time, apparently, to assassinate Donald Trump. He was charged initially with possession of a firearm, which seemed rather weak at the time, but since then they've added three more charges, including trying to assassinate a former president. He is pleading not guilty to the charges, so I guess when the trial comes up we'll find more out about that. But in the meantime, the FBI released a page of his handwriting. He wrote a letter describing what his intention was. It seems really weird. It says, Dear World, who writes that? And also offered $150,000 for anybody who could complete the job. Really? Where does he get $150,000 from? It's all very, very peculiar. And I don't necessarily trust that this is his writing. It could be somebody else's, but I did, a couple of episodes ago, I did Ryan Ruth's handwriting. I did an analysis of it, only the video ran too long. So I put it in again, the next video, and it ran too long again, so I had to keep taking it out of the videos. I thought I would put it in today. This is the handwriting analysis I did of Ruth's or Ralph's handwriting a couple of weeks ago. Here it is. It's a strong and controlling hand belonging to someone with a mission in life and a determination to see it through. He doesn't seem to have developed fully into an adult. There are childlike elements to his character that are still being ironed out. And a lot of buried annoyance, too, that craves release. Private thoughts that go unexpressed. Agendas that are fleshed out but kept under lock and key. The intensity and the energy required to keep it under lock and key could turn out to be damaging to him in the long term. For that reason, and more, he bears the hallmark of a loner, someone whose identity, emotional reactions, pain, and sense of self are kept to himself. This explains why he needs to control incoming events and information, as well as his circumstances, as much as possible. He has very strong emotional responses to events and to people, and either a raft of grudges or a checklist of experiences from his past that he uses to justify his opinions and actions today. See what happened back then? Well, it's going to happen again if you don't listen to me. He feels he's learned lessons that would help others, if only they pay attention. The handwriting has a repressed, compressed, cornered feel to it. Oddly, how he's viewed by those around him is a major factor in his responses. He wants to be acknowledged as a winner, or someone who made good somehow despite the odds. Yet, that's not how it's been. His efforts feel, to him, like spitting into the wind. They just come back to you, unseen by anyone else. A leaning towards vengeance is present getting back at someone in response to hurt caused, aimed at those who have wronged him or criticised his best efforts. He has a lively personality, actually, which some people may find too much to handle, and a good sense of humour at certain times. His opinions and ideas may well be quite fascinating, if ever you sit down and chat with him. Plus, he'd be the kind of person who, if you had him on your side, would play his part, hold things together, champion the underdog, and so on. Problem is, he may feel that he doesn't get this level of cooperation, understanding, or respect back in return. This has hardened him, I think, 
chiselled the edges off his vulnerable side and left him with resentments that are just waiting to burst out of him. And it results in moodiness, a sense of wrestling with his daily temperament in order to stay balanced, and a steady fight against despondency or pessimism. He could get quite depressed on occasions if his best efforts are not rewarded. And I suspect his best efforts are so often not rewarded. He's not a bad person on the whole. Just someone crying out for understanding, empathy, a listening ear, a kind word, or an injection of hope and optimism. But at the same time, he's someone who may be unable to let any of these things in. And there you go. If that really is his handwriting, I find that particularly interesting. And finally, I took a look at the energy of the meeting recently between Donald Trump and Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine. It was a very awkward encounter, mainly because Trump favours Putin and makes no secret of it. But I thought, if I look at the energy of that, I can find out what was really going on. Zelensky said, oh, we had a great meeting. Everything is much better. He was coming with a plan to the US saying, hey, this could be our peace plan. This is how we could sort things out. When I went into their energy, there they are side by side, when I went into their energy, it was as if they both had a hole in one of their legs and there was a cable of some kind connecting them. It went through one hole of one person and then into the hole of the other. So they were tethered, they were tied together, essentially. At some point, though, Zelensky goes, I think I've had enough of this, I'm done, no. Whatever you're asking, whatever your request is, no. And he just stood there with his arms folded. This caught Trump off guard. I think he thinks he can work any deal. He's so charming. He can get round anybody. But no, Zelensky was firm. And Trump goes, hey, Mr. Z, come on, we've got things to gain. This could be very helpful for both of us. But Zelensky wasn't having it. He'd heard something, or found something out, or been told something that made him absolutely resolute. No, 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 no. I'm not going down there. Trump had to keep on going. There was a bar on the wall that he hung on to, and he tried to pull himself and Zelensky as well. Zelensky is a tough cookie. He was immovable. Putin has taken on a worthy enemy here. In the end, the cable snapped or came out of the hole or whatever, and Trump went off around the corner, leaving Zelensky behind him somewhat confused or perplexed or whatever. It's like, oh my God, that guy, he's a nut. Trump went around the corner, down the side of the wall, and ahead of him, there was a subway entrance, like steps into the ground. And at the bottom was a train that would have whisked him away. But I didn't draw it, by the way, <laughs> because there was a reason I didn't draw it, because down a little side street, the sun was setting. This always represents the end of something, the end of a career, the end of an aspiration and so on. But it brought out a kind of wistfulness in Trump, like, oh, if I could only win again, all my troubles would be over. If I get on that train, it whisks me away to oblivion and jail and uncertain times and bankruptcy and infamy. That's where it goes. But hear the sun shining. Oh, feel the warmth as it goes down. It's so beautiful. He was really tempted to go down this little alleyway. I wonder if he says on election day, I won. And everybody goes, hey, yes, Republicans are back in power. The polls were right. He goes off down this side street. But the road ends, doesn't go off into the sunset. It ends. There's a lip there that stops him walking forwards. And all he can do is watch the sun go down. So if he does that thing on election day of, it was rigged, we are the winners of this race, and I am now the 47th president. If he does that, it doesn't last very long, I don't think. 
It takes a while, maybe, to rob him of his delusion. But it does happen. He can only go so far. But he is so consumed with that idea of being powerful, of being president, of having been a massive success. How much higher can you go in the world than the president of the United States of America? He's so consumed by that that he doesn't really see anything else. Part of it was about not wanting to go to jail. But part of it was the delusion that he was still the most powerful man in the world. That people wanted him to get back into power. Yeah, his MAGA base does. And his oligarchy tech bros like Musk and Zuckerberg may as well. But the people don't. And I wouldn't put it past him out of sheer longing and wistfulness to, on election day, say, yay, I won. And now I'm going to be the president again. And then effort has to go in to divesting him of that illusion. But given a choice of going down into the subway and being whisked away to oblivion and jail and endless legal problems, or walking into the sunlight, a man like Trump is going to walk into the sunlight, I would have thought. I can't imagine him giving up and facing accountability. That doesn't seem like him at all. And that's what that felt like. Alrighty, and that's all I got for you. Uh, thank you very much for watching. It's goodbye from him. <coughs> yes, uh, thereby hangs a tail, a cat's tail. And that's what my little video will be about uh, later in the week. I'll explain. It's too much to explain here. But I'll explain what's happened to him and uh, give you a progress report. Alrighty, so I'll speak to you later in the week. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.